And welcome to PGS Reviews. I'm your host, R.M. PGS Reviews was created for PGS members to present their work and review entertainment that stirs the imagination. Today, I'm delighted to be doing a spoiler review of The Protégé with Ben from Cinema Gulp. Hi, Ben. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm wonderful. Ready to talk about this movie. Yes, yes. I've been dying to talk about this uh, movie ever since I saw it. And um, I mean, I, we already know that it's been it's directed by Martin Campbell, who's yes, done things yes. like a bunch of Bond films, right? Um, all those really cool, uh, more modern day Zorros uh, with Catherine Zeta-Jones and Antonio Banderas. Um, so an action thriller from him wasn't a surprise, and it's not also not a surprise that he's able to pull a film like this filled with twists and turns. Yeah, I, I feel this is his most gritty film, uh, at least out of the ones I've seen. I know Casino Royale is pretty gritty for a Bond film, but this one just, this movie has everything I love in like spy action movies because it doesn't hold back with some really delicious violent scenes. Oh, you know, I, I films that put restraints on themselves can sometimes be a little bit lackey for me, whereas this one just has no filter. And that's what I loved so much about it. Like, I didn't love everything in this movie, but I loved its attitude. It had a great attitude. Yeah, and sometimes you need an attitude with a film like this. Um, I mean, we do see action thrillers a lot, but there definitely was some special sense of, of badass with Maggie Q and with Samuel L. Jackson here. That's the thing. The attitude of this movie is letting awesome Hawaiian-born model-turned-actress, Maggie Q, who is the real effing deal, in my opinion. Always loved her from Mission Impossible 3, Live Free or Die Hard. She just has that set of skills, and she's very vocal about she's not really a martial artist, and she wasn't. She just picks things up and likes to do her own stunts, and she's so convincing when she's doing that stuff. She stood out so much in the Die Hard movie and the Mission Impossible movie because she's so convincing. I just I love her. I'm glad I'm glad she gets a vehicle like this to be such a badass and like convince us all how badass she is, you know? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, as you mentioned, she was in those films and I loved her in the Divergent series. She kind of uh, played somebody who, you know, was somewhat threatening to the main characters and you could feel the threat like she was serious. She meant business, and it, it'd be very tough to kind of, you know, turn over or, or, or go through her as an obstacle. But I also liked her in the Nikita series as well. And I think that she brings in a sex appeal that I love. I think that it's just natural in her to uh, bring that sense of, of sensuality to this series. And nothing is better than a thriller that has sensuality in it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and Samuel L. Jackson was also uh, quite a convincing character as Moody, this um, assassin that uh, inevitably, um, you know, has such an impact over the character and his life. Yeah, uh, in, respe res I say this respectfully and without sleaze attached to it. Uh, going back to what you were saying about Maggie Q, I, I think she's phenomenally good to look at, uh, but it's more about her cinematic presence. Um, the way she's leading, the way she leads this film and the way the, the Nikita show, I just love watching her on screen. Um, again, not in a, you know, not in a sleazy way. I'm just fascinated with her on screen. I love profile shots of her. I love her stance, just the way she moves and she's so natural on the camera. It's just, yeah, and this, this movie is just, it's just a feast of you just watching Maggie Q just own the screen. Even if some of the plot details and stuff don't necessarily work perfectly for me. It's all about like her moment and how she's just completely showcased in this movie, so. 
Yeah, she certainly is an elegant and uh, sophisticated um, uh, assassin as far as I'm concerned. And that's what we all imagine assassins to be like. They're not going to be clumsy. They're not going to be unattractive. They're going to be these people that you kind of are like, wow, that's so impressive. And I want to see more of that. So, And I also wanted to say that Michael Keaton also gives a sexy performance in this film. Sure, sure. Yeah, he's he's... He's still just uh, just rocking it. I love the uh, the Keaton sense, the resurgence of Michael Keaton the last ten years. It's been fantastic, and this one I didn't know going into this that they were going to have sort of that relationship, you know. And if we're going into spoilers, it's like they have like a sexual relationship, and the chemistry works really. There's a really funny scene where they're fighting, and then they're rolling out of bed. It's pretty <laughs> great. Uh, see again, that's. Ad, that's the attitude of this movie. It just says F it. You know, it just goes with, it just goes for it in all those, in these great adult themed points, you know? Yes. And we've been craving something like this for a while. I think that the film, the casting was absolutely perfect. And the balance of characters is also something that a lot of times you'll get these ensembles and it'll feel like there's a gap or something's missing or something's off. And yeah. there just wasn't any of that at all in this film. No. And, and again, Michael Keaton, like, aside from keeping, you know, this movie entertaining on the, just the visceral action level, like, he injects, like, a sense of humor and, like, empathy into the script that, again, you don't know who he's going to be when he, when he is introduced. Is he the main villain? He's kind of this weird gray area character that you don't see written a lot in these kind of movies. Like, is he a henchman? Is he the number one guy? Like, why is he... Why does he have more emotional stakes when he shouldn't because of what he does for a living? But yet he all he has like thinking man's kind of perspectives on things. And he's he's got a little bit of what you would call like uh, sympathy for things happening. You know, he's not completely a stoic shit down to business guy. So he's kind of a complicated character, I think. It's not easy to go ahead and introduce that and, and pull it off and make it feel believable. But, um, you know, I think that what made it work was that somewhere deep down inside, I think that the lead character, Anna, believes it, even when she knows that it's not entirely true. So so I think that that element of uh, convincing, that element of finesse uh, is definitely something that someone who is uh, a stealth assassin would have to possess. So, <laughs> and we see that here. In, in the beginning of this film, uh, Moody, who, who is played by Samuel L. Jackson, finds Anna um, as a little girl in Saigon and saves her from an uncertain future. So, um, you know, this was such, such an, uh, like a, a, a grabbing scene. This really was maybe a little shocking was the fact that Moody uh, is, you know, in, in Saigon and unexpectedly he finds this young girl uh, in a room with uh, gangsters who have just been killed and she's holding a gun. Yeah, and really quickly, they didn't even care about doing any kind of de-aging to Samuel L. Jackson. We're just supposed to, he looks exactly the same 30 years later. They just said, oh, whatever, he's Samuel L. Jackson, who cares? <laughs> Shocking is the word for it, for sure. And when they revisit that scene at the end, it's even more shocking. It's disturbing, you know? There's quite a deal of mystery involved in it. Of course, you know, everybody's assuming, and, and rightfully so, that perhaps, actually, the thing that I thought when I first saw her with the gun was that she was just protecting herself. Right. And that yeah. if anybody came in, you know, she had that gun and she was, um, in case there was another back actor who came in because it seemed like that you know where she was staying like was maybe she was kidnapped or under siege but you couldn't quite tell what was going on outside and so when the moody character goes in and he just kind of looks at her and i i think that he realized that this girl was a prisoner and you know clearly he you know looked at her and and just decided to take her under his wing and he couldn't go to like you know an orphanage and deposit her or, or anything like that you know he, there, well there seemed to be happen. some sort of revolution going on um <laughs> because this, it was chaos everywhere and they were rounding people up and she pulls the trigger on him too she pulls the trigger on samuel l like she was just she didn't distinguish him from the next person when you know when they met that was i was like whoa 
we experience that in in one of the next scenes where they're sort of walking to the border, if you will, yeah. to uh, on a mad dash to get out of the country. And you know, this is one of those situations where things bad things do happen at borders when you know there's a revolution or you know like even something that we see today. Of course, like that's what her life her life is gonna ha the direction it took was the best case scenario and like moving from that opening scene to when we establish her as a character it's kind of refreshing to see that she didn't just become an assassin that like follows samuel jackson's order because because i did i thought the movie was going to be kind of like that where it's like oh she's just stoic and silent and but you find out it kind of reminded me of frank oz's the score from 2001 where Robert De Niro is a burglar, but he has a second life where he owns and operates a jazz club in Montreal. And you get you, you get to see how his second life, the life he wants to have, you know, being a jazz club owner, and you get to see his house and his daily routine. And they do that in this movie to show you that she actually turned out to be a pretty cool person, like that has a has a love for rare books and selling books. And it's like so Samuel Jackson's character moody let her become somebody become a person not just his assassin and i was like oh this is great that was when i was like okay this is different at some point um the moody character realizes that um there's quite a lot of espionage and intrigue going on with the characters that he's been dealing with and if it's true according to the story uh where he was paid to assassinate somebody you know let's say 30 years ago or so when when um the anna character was a little girl and now that's something that's coming up and, and is a very important um, part of the story. He realizes that there may be a day of reckoning coming for him. So um, I think that he, he knew that at any point, uh, Anna would have to be able to defend herself and have, you know, a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. And, you know, that's something that I really liked about this film is that, um, you, you know, we see the characters in these, what look like to be, hopeless situations, but they're not hopeless. Um, there is always, it seems like there's always a way to fight back. And I, I, thought, I found it inspiring. I mean, I, I just was really, you know, turned my impression around from when I see a situation presented in a film and it, it looks like you have one situation and it's sometimes it's completely the opposite. Yeah, yeah, they did that quite a bit in this movie, sometimes to a fault where it didn't quite add up correctly or or it just wasn't satisfying i'm not saying it was a lazy script it absolutely was not but uh sometimes when you shoot for one thing and then you try to kind of pull the rug out sometimes it doesn't work that great but but yeah like you know him i mean that's i love like small moments of showing not telling like exactly what these people mean to each other we kind of talked about it with pig like that you need like three to four minutes to show to establish their relationship and then you just get it if it's done right the scene where she gets sam where she gets moody the guitar that's all you need to know about how close they are uh despite him training her to be a killer they're also like father daughter completely you know and they have a wonderful relationship yeah you're exactly right about that and of course that moment is bittersweet because we get a sense that moody may not be in the best health right as right. he uh, receives the gift and kind of reminisces with anna you know about you know all their uh interesting uh forays in um the assassination world and they tend to assassinate individuals who are let's say bad guys yeah. you know you know then we're brought to this um to this scene where, um, you know, as as you mentioned before, Anna has been allowed to create her own life and uh, have a career where she sells extremely rare books that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And then and then she she has uh, one day in her store a very special visitor. Again, that's the scene where you're like, what are they setting him up as? Is he the villain? <laughs> what is going on but uh it, right off the bat they have this mysterious chemistry that you you know she doesn't really just brush him off she's kind of interested and he's obviously very intrigued because he says it over and over and over again she intrigues me you know he says it so many times but yeah that's an interesting little moment there i think we were very interested um as he you know clearly is uh one of the smoothest um 
Lucas uh, men who was not going to be leaving that party unless he got your phone number. I mean, he really was uh, debonair. Everything that you kind of, you know, like, you know, I'm, I like men, so I'm interested in men. That's the type of guy <laughs> that you would say, wow, he really is incredible. I'd love to meet a man like this. And I know she was very aware that he was not necessarily interested in purchasing a book. It was an information visit, yeah. but boy, was it a good visit. I mean, uh, he definitely, uh, you know, uh, aroused her curiosity. I always... I'm always I'm in the minority where I didn't really care for Keaton's uh, Bruce Wayne that much. That's how he should have played Bruce Wayne. That like arrogance, confidence, suave. Like instead, he just was a weirdo. Michael Keaton clearly knows what he's doing in this role. Yeah. Um, and Maggie Q, she uh, was tit for tat. I mean, she knew he didn't want to buy that book, but it was okay. Sometimes you have to play the game to move forward in it, right? We see uh, Anna go on a job with uh, Moody. And this is one of those very interesting moments where uh, it seems to be uh, sort of a ransom situation. And she represents the payer, I believe. And she uh, goes into this uh, house of uh, this gangster and awesome. gives him the money. And, and it, it, it looks quite, you know, uh, bad. And he talks about, here's the money. I want my son returned. And, uh, and then she kind of cleverly, um, you know, lets him in on what's really going on, which is she's there to assassinate him. <laughs> and so she, she gracefully um, finds her way around these gentlemen who are not expecting, they're still in disbelief as she's actually um, commencing in this fight. And it's, uh, it's an arduous fight. It's not sort of, you know, I'm just going to pull out a gun and it's over. It, no, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, she uses skill and technique and finesse to um to get the upper hand she doesn't fully overpower them she gets a few no. punches she gets she gets hurt this movie doesn't want to treat the audience like idiots like a fast and furious movie where a 90 pound jordana brewster is just beating the living crap out of guys 10 times their size <laughs> they make right. her character work for it when she when she's fighting bigger men you know like she has to use the skill set in a different way she's not just going toe to toe by punching them in the face you know, she has to use all these other things, what she does with sheets, you know, and like, I love how much neck snapping she does in this movie. And she does it in like, not the corny way where she can just snap your neck. You know, it doesn't work that way. She, the way she does it, you feel it, you know, like, uh, and it took her a long, it took her a, a lot of energy to snap necks, you know, which is great. I don't think any of us want to see that situation, like you said, with uh, Georgiana Brewster and that completely something that we just are not entirely convinced about um and and it just isn't even uh something that is enjoyable to watch in those cases like what I, rob says right verisimilitude yes <laughs> yes it is yes it is so and and that was very important for us to see that at some point uh anna is uh now uh finding herself um, on the run. Now, I don't know if I have all the, the, the everything in the proper sequence, but it appears that uh, is in her um, in her bookstore, and someone starts to shoot at her in the bookstore. And clearly, there's some sort of hit taken out. And eventually, she finds herself at home, only to discover that someone had gotten to Moody um, and killed him. Therein lies probably my biggest problem with the movie. Um, I'm not sure if you felt the same way. This is the only thing that undermines her uh, intelligence level, that she would not look a little harder and realize, spoilers, that it's not actually Moody laying there. I, f I just feel like, especially when they show the scene where Samuel's just pumping that guy in the bathtub, it's like, or pumping that guy with bullets in the bathtub, like, it just to me it just like when you figure that out i was like no she's smarter than that i don't know i know it, it was a plot device needed to move things along but i don't know how did you feel about that it, it irked me that she was that um i guess you know it did seem gullible and you know i i was concerned about it i I wondered if this was a conversation that they had ever had, you know, you know, the types of conversations I might have with my mother is, would you like to go to the movies or would you like to go to the mall? For them, they say, well, in, in case somebody comes and kills me, you know, here's our, you know, like yeah, what's. They, 
they seem that <laughs> she's like, oh, this is so out of the blue. It's like, no, wouldn't you live every day of your life assuming that that might happen? When Anna finds uh, Moody dead this way, um, she uh, decides to uh, track down um, something that Moody was talking about. Now, did he tell her that he was uh, looking into this person that yes, by yes. name? He yeah. did tell yeah. her that he was looking for Haynes. Okay. Yeah, he gave her the name too, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was probably the last conversation she had with him. And she knew that she had to find this person. But of course, this is a little different because she's going around and doing this solo. Yeah, and she doesn't know what he was looking into this for. You know, so her, as well as us, like we are kind of lost, but we're assuming that the pieces are going to fall into place. Um, like something as great as Pig did. It all just kind of comes together. And, and it didn't really do that for me in some of the choices. Uh, and I, I, and I want to say, and I'm not jumping ahead because I'm just dropping this in real quick, but it's like mm -hmm. when Moody tells the main bad guy, whatever his name, um, bad guy number 20, like, yeah. uh, you know, I was just going to find your son and tell him I'm sorry. And you Oh, Hayes. Hayes is the guy's name. I think yeah. it's Hayes. Yeah. And it's, you know, that reveal, I was like, ah, oh, that's so like soap opera y. That's like kind of cheesy. I don't know. Um, so she heads off to her objective now is to find this person, Hayes, who, you know, seems to be someone. Um, surrounded by mystery but also must be a very very dangerous person because whoever is uh trying to assassinate her it's clear to her that that it's connected to to Hayes and and whatever it is that he must be doing especially since we know that they you know tend to assassinate people who are on the wrong side of the law is, is Hayes the one that uh, shoots the other guy right in the head? Just like it's nothing, just very nothing. It's du Duquette, I yeah, think. You know the names better than I do. I didn't I didn't quite keep those names of the villains and stuff in my head, but- Well, I, I wrote favorite. it down, that's what I, know. Okay. <laughs> I wrote it down. That's, that's my favorite action scene in the movie where she's just busting ass through those hallways. Just some of the most creative kills and she even pulls a John McClane where she grabs yes. the, uh, the fire hose and goes down. Yes. Oh, that was so great. And again, it wasn't done in a re it wasn't done in a glossy, stupid action way. It was very realistic. It wasn't super cool to look at. It was like that. This is what she needs to do. Great, great thing is she goes. She makes it out of there and then gets hit by that car so bad. That was like, that was like straight up meet Joe Black, uh, Black <laughs> bouncing off cars. And, you know, let's be honest, what was it, 20 guys? It took 20 guys just to get her, and they were lucky she ran into the street. So yeah. let's imagine if she did, she was running on the sidewalk, they had to chase her with a car, maybe she would have gotten away in that manner, but... Oh, yeah, she um, would have gotten away had she not got, got just pancaked by that car, yeah. Uh, Duque, is, he's very upset that she has kind of uh, mocked him, so to speak, like... You know he's gonna have a scar from this <laughs> and you know he's tough as nails but he almost feels like um from the way that the character is he almost feels like she's been defiant towards him and how dare she so i think that's why they started waterboarding her you know he was going to get back at her he wasn't doing that to break her he was just doing that to get back at her in a sense of um oh, absolutely it was definitely like a passion thing yeah for sure he was yeah he was bent like yeah that's a good and point. you know Absolutely. Like, you know, he takes off his jet. This isn't exactly what happened in the film, but I could see it's it's a take off your jacket moment, roll up your sleeves. And, you know, if it took two or three days or two or three weeks or two or three months to, to just, you know, really hurt her and humiliate her, he would. But you were right. He wasn't going to be able to break her. And that's when uh, the Michael Keaton character, his name is, I guess, Rembrandt. Yeah. Rembrandt. Uh, and yeah, he's like that fixer, sort of. Like, hey, I, I'm sending this guy in because he's going to calm down and manage the situation the smart intelligent way even though you know he doesn't get a chance to because she she's you know she manages to get out of there and some of the, again some of the best kills is when she gets out of that room um oh my god the face in the sink that was a good one yeah but while we're talking michael keaton i hate to say this because maggie q is the star and i love her so much in this but my favorite kill has got to be from michael keaton 
when he just takes that guy's face and smashes it when they're fighting in like that little restaurant uh, uh, kitchen, the way he just smashes that guy's face into the counter was legend. And the few people that were in the theater we were ah, like everybody was like, ah, because it was just brutal. I loved it. <laughs> it truly was satisfying. I mean, we saw some satisfying kills. I mean, I know I that's what they were. I mean, um, these were the bad guys, but at some point, um, someone is trying to make a hit on Michael Keaton. That's the scene to set up that Michael Keaton is can be a, a gray area person. Does he become an ally with her? Because, because they've somehow put a hit out on him and I don't know if I caught why. Yes, I, I have a feeling that Michael Keaton is very high up in the organization. He's probably Hayes' personal bodyguard. Yeah, yeah. And that's a very desirous position. And Duque is a pretty darn good, you know, bodyguard himself. He's not horrible. But I have a feeling that he had some sort of resentment towards Michael Keaton even showing up. Because yeah. Duque figures, well, we have her here. There's no reason for you to be here. We have it under control. And of course, Michael Keaton was like, no, you don't. You don't realize you're in trouble right now. She's not bending to your will. You think you are winning and she's actually watching you and watching for when you make that mistake. And that's exactly what happened. So Duque sees him as someone who can, uh, you know, um, observe him, so to speak, um, and even make him seem like he's not as important in the organization. So uh, I, I, I could see why uh, Michael Keaton would be a target of a hit in a place where, you know, people wouldn't even talk about it. No one would ever know. That was the mistake they made. So he knew he was being followed. So he was expecting it and therefore it wasn't a surprise. And of course you mentioned his fighting style and how he killed that guy, but he did it just in, in a way that he always kept his composure, which was brilliant. We never really saw him mad in this film. No, um, no that's a great thing about his character too, is he just is always calm and cool, always, you know? And yeah, his fighting again, like him and Maggie Q, like, his thing is he's an older guy. So he's also not just straight up using brute strength. He has to use resourceful methods of fighting as well. You know, and that's what's so creative about the fight scenes of this movie. It's like, what object are you going to pick up and beat the shit out of somebody with? And like, how do you use it? You know, and the face plant, like all of it, it's, it, it's not just hand to hand stuff, you know? Then we get into a, a little bit of a, a little bit of romance where, um, I love that scene. I love that scene. Oh, it's gosh. Like Martin Campbell doing what Martin Campbell does. If you go, I mean, how many, like he had uh, obviously uh, on a top from like Goldeneye yes. fighting Bond. And then uh, the one that it harkened back to the most for me was Zorro, where Catherine Zeta Jones and, uh, and Zorro have their little back and forth. I mean, obviously yes. that was more PG rated than this one. But uh, it was just glorious. There's so many cool techniques, and it was very hot. I, I thought it was very hot. Well, you know, getting back to the Zorro, like, what woman wouldn't want to have her clothes taken off by by Zorro using a whip? Like, <laughs> you know, so cleverly, you know, like, so gently and cleverly and cunningly uh, declothes you, um, you know, with <laughs> <laughs> just the best scene I have ever seen of two assassins pointing guns at one another in a compromising position. I mean, this was just absolutely intoxicating. Yeah. And I don't know whether it was better of what was going on above the table or below the table, but I have to say, I couldn't turn my eyes away from that scene. She was wearing this incredible dress, mm -hmm. um, you know, and she just was just waiting, waiting for this encounter. And, and, it was just unbelievable how much anticipation was rolled up in this part. I mean, you know, literally in a public restaurant, they have guns loaded and cocked and ready to go. And, uh, you know, they allow themselves to be vulnerable in front of one another. And her, um, her and line that I won't repeat about where he's pointing the gun just again goes with the attitude of this movie, the I don't give a crap attitude of this movie. You know, it was, it was glorious. <laughs> and, and of course the metaphor for the gun towards her there, um, you know, she was ready to receive whatever he was gonna be uh, <laughs> releasing. 
And so was, so was everyone. I mean, you know, this was just absolutely phenomenal. We didn't actually see anything, but sometimes those innuendos, those situations where uh, the sexual tension is high and the stakes are high and the uh, chemistry is high. I mean, it was fireworks all the way. The fighting, they're using their fighting styles, but they're clearly pulling their punches when they're in that house. Like, uh, they're, they're not they're not t at the top of their game. Like, she could have, if he was a regular guy and she was walking around with that giant shotgun, she would have killed him in two seconds. But when she's got her legs wrapped around him and he pins her up against the wall and it's so hot right there, and then she just has, I think, the bookends or something, and she just whacks him in the head with the bookends. <laughs> Yeah, this is ruining my shop, but I didn't do it. <laughs> it's like she could have killed him there. And there's, yes. and they could have yeah. killed each other several times. And then, you know, he asks her the question, you know, you going to kill me or are you going to boom, you know? And then the, 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 the editing of the cut was fantastic <sighs> because I didn't want to see more than that. I liked it that we didn't. It just cut to they're in bed and they just finished having sex. And it's perfect, you know, and like. Oh my God, what are we doing? They, they also addressed the ludicrous. Like, we should get the hell out of here. Like, we've been shooting guns in this house. Like, whose house? Where are we? Like, and she's like, but this is a perfectly good bed, you know? So I was like, <laughs> you have Anna and Rembrandt laying in bed, um, doing a little bit of kind of strange pillow talk. And then within minutes, she is hurt, leaving the house. And then she finds the reveal that Moody's still alive. And there, I, I found this juxtaposition very interesting because the two the, the next time you see her and samuel L. jackson they're lying in a bed and it's like within a few minutes of each other the two men in her life there's these they're represented very differently one was like sexual and one was like you know very family but it's like i found that interesting that like so quickly she's lying in bed in two different scenarios with two different guys in her life like and i don't really know what that meant except for when she's on the job and she's in the Rembrandt bed, like she's the hard ass. She's like, you know, I'll, I'll bang you and then I'll kill you or you kill me, whatever. And then she's vulnerable and soft and daughter like when she's laying in the bed with Moody. The bed is, a, is an intimate place. And the only time that you would ever be in bed with a man is if you have an intimate relationship with him. In other words, you shouldn't be sleeping next to a guy if you just want to be his friend. Um, if it's if it's a, a, a loved one, maybe you would be sitting in a bed or, or near a loved one, like, you know, your dad or your uncle, even your brother, you know, like you go in your brother's room, you go in there. But um, that's what it represented. So uh, the only men who would be in her bed that way would be somebody that she had an intimate relationship with. And of course, I mean, by intimacy is like a parent, you, you have a very close intimate relationship with your parents or, or loved ones. Yeah. So that's what the bed represented. What we're on to now is Anna and, and Moody um, and what they plan on doing to, to Hayes. Yeah, which uh, again is a little, jumbled you know uh, as far as what their plot was or what their plan was and i don't know uh it's it, it, I, I i still don't know if i love or hate the bad guy lair bunker with nameless faceless henchmen all in black with giant hum hummers it just seemed out of place for this movie but like it felt like commando the ending of commando you know we're like oh there's this big bunker and we gotta we gotta get inside and kill the dictator and the, it's just all these this army of people like protecting this guy at his own private island i was like what is happening right now you know as as anna um has made it clear to the brand brand character that she's going to uh, make an assassination attempt on hayes's life and you know there's there's that obligatory yes we've checked everyone on the list or you know um yeah, yeah. <laughs> comment that you know you always hear it's like we've checked and double checked you know and of course someone gets in she she manages to infiltrate the party by being a hostess or a waitress or whatever and it's obvious it's her and he's and the Rembrandt character is literally watching her like he can't take his eyes off of her they're fooling us because this is the sloppiest she's ever been as an assassin but it's all done on purpose you know and the whole thing was to get Michael Keaton away from the situation, chasing her so that he's completely eliminated from the equation. And I, that was a really good reveal. It really was. Um, and of course we saw an explosion and with Moody's a little tricky. 
he's a little tricky. He, I think Michael Keaton's character, Rembrandt, says to, um, says to Anna, well, um, I'm not going to let you assassinate Hayes or something like that. Or, or, and she, she coyly says, well, that's not the plan. Yeah. Like she says in the beginning of the film, uh, uh, in another job, once uh, Rembrandt realizes that he's, I wouldn't say outplayed, I would say he realizes he's been distracted. Yeah. And, and ironically, so has Hayes, because Moody is in that bunker with him, you know, and, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, you know that Moody isn't there to sort of like wish you well, like this is... <laughs> this no, is certainly they, not why he's there. They have a they have a they have a con an actual conversation in that bunker uh, where, you know, I'm almost just as we're talking about it coming around to it more that it's not so bad when Samuel Jackson's like, look, you know, had you known why I was looking for your son, it wasn't to kill him. It was to finally tell him I'm sorry for killing you. You know, he's like, I was just gonna find him and apologize to him, but you just jumped the gun and had me killed and other people killed. So I liked that he explained that to the bad guy, you know, and let the bad guy feel like that guilt a little bit. So then, you know, uh, presumably Hayes and or Moody were in this explosion, and that's all we really know. Yeah. And Anna uh, manages to slip away in the confusion of the explosion, but she ends up at the same building where when she was a little girl, Moody had found her in. So, and then things turn very, very dark there, even more dark than what we've witnessed in this film. Yeah, and again, the, the uh, us finally getting to see like, uh, you know, that her family got caught up in this whole thing and their family was just executed in front of her is really horrible. Um, and then them sort of, hinting at that that guy was just about to probably rape this kid that's what it looked like right he was yes. getting ready he was getting a blanket in there it was like oh yes. my god oh, it was so disturbing but oh. i get that though because that makes it so much more rewarding when she just unloads a machine gun into him well um i think that uh we've seen uh these two uh lovebird assassins if you want to call it that take shots at each other and you know nothing really happens you know if you two are the last one standing and you know maybe uh they can walk away and and fight another day it's not so bad you know in the world of an assassin um and i think that that's what we got here but i also think that um somebody like uh the the rembrandt character um, may have more at stake in this type of an attack against his boss than meets the eye. You know, there might be someone higher up on the chain. That's the only thing I can think of, because otherwise, why even pursue her in any other way other than, hey, let's 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 go out. Let's go out on dates. You know, like y you beat me, but my boss is dead. So I'm OK. I mean, I don't have to answer for my for my uh, screw ups because he's dead. It's like. It, it seemed like he was going there more to plead with her. And that's what I don't like at all about this last like two minutes because they didn't really need, like, if you're going to have them meet back up, I hate this term, subvert our expectations uh, and don't have them stand off. Maybe just, I honestly would have been satisfied if they just walked out of that building together at the end and you don't know what happens, but it's like, let's, freaking try it now we have a new team we have a new team you know like and the fact that it just like off screen gunshots and then one of the quickest lousiest edits ever of her walking out that door uh, the, uh, the little pan down and she walks out the door and then boom credits you're like what what like you ever heard of processing like give us one 30 more seconds like i don't know i, I had a big problem with that because i was like well wait a minute so what the hell just happened? <laughs> like, no, I agree with you. I think that that there definitely needed to be a little bit more closure. And I think what everybody was looking for um, was not necessarily um, a final conclusion to what happened, but some direction. Yeah. Um, we don't know what direction Michael Keaton might be going in. We know he tracked her down here, but she clearly let him find her. Um, yeah. We also don't know... Um, 
why there was gunfire in that building at all if they knew that they didn't want to kill one another. We know they don't want to kill another. She said, I know you'll always chase after me, but I don't think he's always going to chase after her to kill her. I don't think that's his motivation. I think he, he probably really likes this woman and maybe he wants to control her. It's true. He may want to control her. That's a well, he doesn't want her, you know, putting herself in life and death situations. I, I don't think he did want to control her. I, f I feel he thought of her as an equal in every single way. Like, if anything, he would he would he would probably submiss a little bit to to her. Ooh. I mean, Ooh. That's, that's what I feel. And I almost I feel like that. he was going <laughs> in that direction. He was the one out of the two of them where he's like, what if I wasn't going to try to kill you? Like, you know, and she never changed. She was just like, no, this can't work. This can't happen. And like, we like both of these people, even though they're, yeah. you know, they kill people, but we don't want them to shoot each other. And no. because of how, how, how quick the ending was, I don't know. Did she shoot him or did they just shoot up at the air and like walk out separately? Yeah. Why not this show is it? the, like, it's not they could have. They could have shown that. They could have shown like where um, they shoot at one another and she goes one direction and he goes in the other and they don't see that each other have walked out. Yeah. So um, that could have been uh, a very interesting take on that. But um, we really have nothing to show at the end of the film. We don't know if Hayes is deceased. We don't know if Moody is deceased. And we don't know um what's ha really happened with anna and with uh, rembrandt so end, this is nothing happened in this movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> the end <laughs> and i want to think that the reason why is because there's going to be there has to be a part two there has to be a part two to this it depends on if uh if they can make a profit off this based on its budget you know i i love seeing these kind of movies though because it's what Rob Rob calls them these sometimes too, and as do a lot of people in the business. They're the mid-level movies. They're not the blockbusters, and they're not indie. They're the mid-level movies that they used to make so much in the '80s and '90s. You know, just sort of that mid-range, like 20, 30, 35 million, something like that. We need more of those. We need more of these kind of movies with like semi auteur directors just showcasing their strengths with action and making Maggie Q one of the biggest freaking stars in the world like she deserves to be because she's freaking awesome. <laughs> so. Yeah, she just shined in this film. Any final thoughts about the film? Um, go see it because it's really, it's a fun time with great, great fight choreography, uh, inventive, glorious, deliciously awesome, violent kills. And uh, final thought is just, uh, yeah, I just want to see Maggie Q and everything. Yeah, I do too, and Michael Keaton, um, with just the right amount of action and romance and intrigue. Uh, for those of you watching this, you won't be disappointed in The Protégé. It's playing in theaters now. Ben, where can people find you? You can find me on uh, YouTube, at CinemaGulp. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we got a lot of stuff coming up as well on the show. Um, we're actually having another episode of First of the Best, which is going to be on Paul Thomas Anderson and Wes Anderson's very first films. Oh, that's great. Well, Ben, thank you for joining me here on PGS Reviews. As Ben said, you can find Ben and Cinema Gulp on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, please join us again for upcoming PGS Reviews episodes. And remember, be kind. So I thought long and hard about this one. And at one point I did have Nancy Sinatra in my hand as my vinyl recommendation as a companion piece to the protege. But I changed my mind because the song kept ringing in my head the entire time I was watching it. People who died. So I had to go with Catholic Boy from the Jim Carroll band. If you guys don't remember, People Who Died is a pretty wonderful song and it's played in lots of movies. Well, where a lot of people die. <laughs>